Njal rolled out of bed and put on his pants and boots and fastened a belt around his waist. Berger eyed him, but didn't stir, pulled on a heavier wool shirt, and walked over to the sheep that was bleating in the corner. He shivered as he walked. The winters had been getting colder, and some of his neighbors were worried that the cold would be too harsh and they wouldn't be able to plant crops. Gorm, the local priest, kept telling the villagers to have faith that God would provide, but it did little to ease the mind of many in the settlement. There were rumors that some had even started practicing the old ways and that Ragnarok was coming. Y'all didn't believe any of the rumors, but the wolves had been more vicious lately, and it was enough to set most people on edge. Y'all tried to ignore everything as he started feeding and tending to his sheep, and Grisnir, for his part, kept bleeding happily as he ate his breakfast. After that was done, Njal decided to make his own breakfast, hoping that he would wake up after a good meal. Before long, he had finished cooking, and he started digging into his oatmeal with ravenous hunger. As he ate, Berger walked over and started gnawing on a bone that was lying by the hearth. He hadn't realized just how hungry he was until he had mixed it in the honey and taken his first bite. In a matter of minutes, the bowl was empty. He sighed, cleaning up after his mess, and proceeded with his day. He put on a cloak and grabbed his hunting gear as he stepped outside into the cold. Snow had piled up in front of the door, and his feet sank in several inches. Yal gasped from the cold and pulled the cloak tighter around him. It was definitely getting colder. He shivered as he set out for the forest. He looked around and saw men and women slowly emerging from their houses, fastening their cloaks tighter just like he had. They were all a long way off, but even at a distance he could see that they were nervous. He watched his neighbors as they set about their days. He saw women heading out to do laundry, and men heading out to fish or hunt or gather firewood. As he watched, he could see children running through the fields, laughing and playing in the snow. They were the only ones that didn't look worried. He supposed it was their right. Let the adults worry. Before long, Njal was at the tree line. Some of the trees had shed their leaves, but the pines were still their normal, vibrant green. It almost made the winter feel less cold. Njal knelt before entering the forest and said a quick prayer to St. Olaf asking him for protection and a successful hunt. He then crossed himself and rose to his feet. He was hoping to find squirrels or foxes or something smaller he could take home with him. With any luck, it could keep him fed for a little while, and he might be able to make something out of the pelt. While he was thinking about what game to hunt, he heard wings flapping, and he looked up to see an eagle flying overhead. He followed a bird with a smile and thanked St. Olaf for the guidance. Berger followed closely behind, pausing every now and then to smell the air. Njal followed the bird for over an hour before losing it in the trees. It was then that he let Berger take over for him. The dog sniffed the air for a moment and took off towards the east, barking the whole time. Njal did his best to keep up with the dog. Before long, he saw what Berger had been chasing. It was a red fox. He looked healthy and had a bright, shiny pelt. The fox tried running, but Berger was faster, and every way the fox tried to move, Berger was already there, like a big, furry wall. Njal had almost gotten close enough to cast a spear at the fox when the fox made one last desperate attempt and sprang between Berger's legs. Before Njal or Berger knew what had happened, the fox was out of sight. Njal kicked the ground in frustration, but Berger took off after the fox, and soon both Hound and Master were chasing the critter. Before long, Berger was too far ahead for Njal to see, and he had to follow the sound of the dog's bark. Njal heard Berger's barking become more frantic and scared, and a worm of fear worked its way through him. Berger was a well-trained dog and wasn't easily scared. Njal could tell Berger was in danger, and he went from running to sprinting, trying to catch up with his pet. Njal began to grow more scared. He relied on Berger to hunt and to keep him sane through the long winters. Berger had been Njal's only close companion for a while, and he couldn't afford to lose him. But while Njal thought about losing Berger, his mind started thinking about himself. Whatever was enough to scare his dog was definitely enough to send him to his ancestors. He was afraid that the dog had run into wolves, or even worse, a bear. Njal tried to control the panic rising in his chest when he burst into a small clearing. Berger was lying down, but he looked unharmed, and he'd stopped barking as soon as he saw Njal. Relief instantly washed over him. Once he made sure Berger was all right, he knelt to examine what had frightened the dog. Several feet away from the dog was an elk carcass. It had been mutilated and eviscerated to the point that it was hardly recognizable. The only reason he could tell it was an elk was because of the head which had been torn from the animal's body and split into two pieces. Blood and gore were scattered all around the clearing, and Njal had trouble finding somewhere that wasn't covered with the remains of the dead animal. The elk was concerning. Njal had no idea what could have torn the animal apart. His first thought was either a grizzly or a wolf, but he doubted a grizzly would have attacked a full-grown bull elk, 
and wolves and bears would have eaten the oak instead of leaving it scattered in pieces across the ground. His next thought was that maybe another person had attacked the animal and killed it, but a hunter wouldn't have wasted the meat either. His mind drifted briefly to rumors about settlers practicing the old ways, and he wondered if some of his kinsmen were making pagan sacrifices, but he dismissed the idea as soon as it came to him. It would have looked different. If it were a pagan sacrifice, it would have been cleaner, and the elk would have been hanging from the tree and not scattered across the ground. It was possible the scralings had killed the creature, but food was scarce enough that he doubted they would have left any trace of the animal either. He looked more closely at the remains, searching for any sign of a weapon, but if the beast had been killed by an arrow or a spear, there was no way to tell. If anything, Njal thought the elk looked like it had been torn apart by some great beast, and his mind went back to a grizzly. He stood up and shook his head. That must have been it. The grizzly had gotten into a fight with an elk, and then been chased off before it could finish its meal. A grizzly was really the only thing that made any sense. Njal turned to leave. Grizzly or not, he wasn't touching the meat. Something about the whole situation felt off. He must have felt off to Berger too, because no matter how much Njal coaxed Berger, the dog wouldn't go anywhere near the carcass. He even refused to eat any of the remains, even though all he had had was a bone for breakfast. Njal shook his head, and he and Berger walked away from the elk. The fox was long gone, and he had wasted enough time on the dead animal. He would have to make up for lost time and try and find some other animal to hunt, and of course, he'd have to watch out for grizzlies too. Njal stepped into the meat hall. The warmth from the hearth washed over his body and helped thaw the chill that had set into his bones. He breathed into his hands and rubbed them vigorously. The incident with the elk was still in his mind, but he hadn't had much time to dwell on it. Instead, he had spent most of his day tracking down a pair of rabbits. He had almost caught up to them when the snow started to pick up, and he knew he needed to head back to town if he didn't want to get trapped in the snowstorm. He had planned on going home and making a small meal before an early bed, but his hunger had gotten the better of him. So instead of going home, he went to the meat hall for a warm meal and a drink to drive out the cold. He sat down and put in an order with one of the mates, paying her in advance with a few silver coins. Berger settled in next to him, and before long, the maid brought him a plate with a piece of salmon, some peas and onions, and a side of skirt. She placed a cup of mead next to his plate and walked away. They all said a prayer and crossed himself before tossing a piece of the salmon to Berger, and the pair started ravenously attacking their food. He was about halfway through his plate before he overheard the men to his left sitting on the same bench as him. He didn't have to look over to know who the men were. The settlement was small enough that everyone knew everyone. He could tell by their voices that they were bow and on. Normally, he wouldn't have listened in on their conversation. As far as Njal was concerned, their conversation was their own, and if he had wanted to talk, he would have struck up a conversation with them. But they said something that caught his attention. He leaned in closer to hear them more clearly. Bo spoke first. He was an older man, in his mid-forties, with broad shoulders and a long black beard. He was gruff, and his features were worn from several years of hard work on the farm. His nose had been broken and set poorly, giving him a sort of misshapen face. Despite his rough appearance, he was a light-hearted and charismatic individual. He always wore bright colors whenever he could, and it seemed like whenever there were five or more people, he was one of the ones in the crowd. He was also one of the funnier people in the settlement, and he had a knack for telling jokes and tall tales. I'm telling you, Warren, that's what the Skraelings said. Three of them showed up, all of them dressed in furs and feathers and headdresses, angry and shouting, saying that one of their young men was torn limb from limb. The biggest one started pointing fingers at us, saying that when he found the boy's foot, he had to walk for half a day to find his head. And he said they blame us for it. He said only our swords and axes could have carved up a boy like that. Arn, for his part, wasn't impressed. Arn was a strong young man. He towered over Njal and everyone else in the settlement, too. He was six foot seven inches, but his muscles made him look even bigger, and he had strong legs and arms that seemed like they were made out of steel. When he was still a boy, he wrestled a young grizzly with his bare hands, and he could cast a spear farther than any man in town. He wasn't a bully or a brute, but he knew how to use his strength, and that gave him a confidence that often led him to do brash and impulsive things. He was also handsome, but with a thick beard of fiery red hair, and between his strength and his looks, he had every girl in town fawning all over him. When he opened his mouth to speak, he spoke with a loud and booming voice that seemed to carry with no effort. Damn the scrapes. Either they're lying or you are. I know every man, woman, and child in this town, and not a single one of them would do something like that. It was probably one of their own people, making a pagan sacrifice or something. Or maybe it was just some bear that got a taste for blood and started hunting. Or maybe it's just some far-fetched story by an old man who doesn't know when the joke's gone too far. I've had enough of this. 
Arn slammed his cup into the table and tried to storm out of the hall, but Bo arrested his arm. I swear by the Blessed Virgin that I'm not joking. They were really here, and that's really what they said. Bo cast his eyes around the room frantically, like he was looking for someone to corroborate his story. His eyes landed on Yal, who had been content to listen up until then. Yal, you must have seen this great. Tell Arn what happened. Yal shrugged his shoulders and told Bo that he hadn't seen the Skraelings or even been in town, causing Arn to roll his eyes and scold Bo, which in turn made Bo even more exasperated. Yal interrupted them, though, and told them what he had seen in the woods and how the elk looked exactly like how Bo had described the Skraeling. Now it was Bo's turn to rub it in, which he wasted no time doing. Arn rolled his eyes again and asked if he had seen what the cause of it was. Yal shook his head, saying that he figured it was a grizzly, but he couldn't be sure. He also mentioned how it affected Berger. This caused Bo and Arn to argue again, even more fiercely than before. Njal ignored them and finished his meal. After clearing his plate and downing his drink, Njal got up to leave, but before he had made it to the door, he felt a hand on his arm. He turned to see Thyra. She was one of the maids who had worked in the meat hall, and she was the only one who wasn't one of the owner's children. She had been brought over as a slave from Iceland and sold to the family who owned the meat hall. Ostensibly, she had earned her freedom by the time she was sixteen and had been free for over four years, but she still worked for her former owners, and with no dowry she had little prospects of doing anything else. She had long golden hair tied in braids, soft, smooth features, and bright blue eyes. The only thing that marred her face was a large burn on the left side, stretching from her eye down to her chin. Yal had always thought she was kind enough, but he rarely gave her much thought. Something about her was different, though. There was a look in her eyes that frightened Yal turned to face her, and she spoke so quietly that he had to strain to hear. She asked him if what he had said about the elf was true, and he told her it was, swearing it to her when she seemed skeptical. The look of fear on her face grew, and she told him about a goat that had escaped two days before. She had gone out looking for it, and found it in the same state as the elk. She asked him not to go spreading any rumors, but to go out searching for answers if he could. Njal said that he wouldn't talk about the issue any further and that he would keep a lookout for anything similar when he went out hunting the next day. She thanked him and went back to work, and Yal and Berger stepped out into the cold. Yal kept his word and didn't mention the elk, but it didn't matter. Overnight, the whole town was talking about the unknown killer that was attacking scraylings and wild animals. The children even made a game out of it, where one of the children was chosen to be the killer, and all the other children had to find out who it was before the rest of them died. To make matters worse, two days after Njal's experience with the elk, one of the settlers found another victim. One of the slaves had run off and was found mauled and eviscerated in the woods. A day later, another scraling party showed up, hurling even more accusations at the town. Another one of the people had been found in the same state, this time a young girl who hadn't even seen twelve winters. The scralings still thought the settlers were responsible, and the settlers thought it was the scralings. Fighting would have broken out immediately if Arn hadn't intervened. He was still convinced that it was some wild animal or savage beast, and said that he would go out with the bravest of the Skraling warriors to hunt and kill whatever was responsible. One of the men in the Skraling's delegation agreed, and the two men set out to put a stop to the killings. It seemed to help calm both the Skralings and the settlers, but when it had been another three days and neither man had returned, both parties grew even more nervous. Yal hadn't really known what to make of the matter. He didn't know if it was a man or a beast that was responsible, or something else altogether. Since seeing the elk carcass, he had been a bit shaken, but there wasn't much he could do. So, without any better ideas, he did the most practical thing he could think to do. He kept about his normal day to day. To Njal, it felt like he was the only one who was doing this. Most of the settlers were too afraid of the killer to stray too far from the town, but as far as Njal saw the matter, he could die just as easily from the cold or from hunger as he could from a bloodthirsty manhunter. Njal decided the best use of his time was to hunt. If he was lucky, he could catch some game for dinner and even if he wasn't, he could still look for answers for Thyra. So he spent every day since the elk encounter hunting, save one where he found himself short on firewood, and for five days he failed to find any game or any trace of the killer. Early on the sixth day, he woke up and went out into the woods. He hadn't spoken with most people in town since Arn and Skraling had left for their hunt. He had been too busy, and even if he hadn't, everyone else was too scared. He figured that one more day wouldn't change any minds. He was almost out of fresh meat, and if he didn't find any game soon, he'd have to start fishing. So he set out to go hunting with Berger one last time. On the way out to the forest, he saw four stones at the edge of his farm. One tall stone that was at least seven feet high, one that was four and a half feet high, and two that were only a foot or so tall. He knew the route well enough. He had hunted along the path more times than he can count. But he hadn't been down that path in years. 
The stones were covered in snow that hid the runes and the paintings, but Nial knew what was written on them without having to see the stones. He didn't usually like to go near the stones, and that day was no exception, but it was the only trail through the forest that he hadn't explored in a while, and his best shot of finding any animal was past the stones. As he approached the stones, he slowed to a stop and let out a long sigh. He screwed up his eyes tight and tried to think of some other trail or something else to do with his day. But when he opened his eyes again, he saw an eagle perched on top of the tallest stones. He let out a long groan at the omen and cleared off the smallest stone so that he could sit down. He closed his eyes and rubbed his temples trying to think of something to say, but nothing came to him. Finally, he said a quick prayer to St. Nicholas and St. Gertrude for the souls of his kin, and another prayer to St. Olaf for guidance. Then he rose and quickly walked away into the forest, not daring to look back at the stone. Njal wandered deep into the woods, following tracks from hares and foxes and other small game that would be easier to bring back with him. Once or twice he spotted a deer or an elk through the trees, but there were too many for a clear shot. It was only a few hours past midday, and the sun was already nearing the horizon by the time Njal had found anything. He managed to kill a large hare, but it was only enough for him and Berger to have dinner. Still, he wasted no time cooking or cleaning it, and he and Berger huddled around a small fire while they ate their small dinner. While he ate, he thought, not for the first time, about the sudden scarcity of animals. He hadn't even seen another animal carcass. It was like everyone was trying to hide from whatever lurked in the woods. Everyone except him. His stomach interrupted his thoughts with a loud growl. He tossed a bone to Berger and sighed. He decided it was high time for him to head back, and just as he was about to put out the campfire and head home, he saw a silver fox. Its pelt was flawless, and it seemed to shine in the dwindling daylight. He slowly reached for his bow and silently knocked an arrow. But just as he drew back to shoot at the animal, it ran into the woods as if it were being chased. Nial sighed and released the bow, putting the arrow back in his quiver. He quickly cleaned up his camp and got ready to head back to his house. He couldn't get the fox out of his head. Finally, after debating with himself for a long moment, he decided to follow the fox. He knew the fox was long gone, but the tracks were still clear in the snow, and he moved quickly to gain ground with Berger right on his heels. After a few minutes, it began to snow, and Njal started to run after the creature for fear of the trail running cold. He could feel himself getting closer, and before long, he thought he could almost hear it. Then, he did hear it. It was a yipping howl that was cut short in a loud yelp. Fox's cry of pain was followed by a low growl that Njal didn't so much hear as feel. It seemed to run through his bones, and it sent a chill down his spine. Njal's run turned into a full sprint until he burst into a small clearing and tumbled to the ground. He landed face first in the fox's bloody remains, which wasn't hard since, like the elk, the fox had been torn to pieces and the blood had been scattered all across the ground. He pushed himself to his knees and wiped the blood from his face. As he looked around, he saw bits of silver fur and pools of blood, as well as one long, bloody trail from where the killer had dragged the fox's body through the snow. He shuddered and crossed himself, then gave Berger a command to head back and find help. Then, readying his spear and his axe, Njal followed the trail into the woods. Berger paused before leaving, but he silently obeyed, and for the first time since the killer had struck, Njal felt truly and deeply scared. But he pushed down his fears and began hunting down whatever had taken away the fox. The sun had dipped below the horizon before Njal had found the end of the trail, leaving him in an eerie twilight. He stopped to light a torch and then continued following the trail. It wasn't difficult. Whatever had killed the fox had no concern that it was being followed, and Njal made good time. Soon he found the rest of the fox at the mouth of a cave, and the trail stopped. Njal took in a deep breath and stepped over the fox into the cave. It was pitch black, but it seemed to only go in one direction. He followed the cave for several yards before it split. Several branches led up into the ceiling, and there didn't seem to be any good way to reach them. To his left, the cave dropped off sharply and went down farther than Njal could see with the torch. In front of him, the cave continued downward in a gentle slope, but it was slick and uneven, and it made for slow going. Njal picked his way down slowly, but made one misstep and fell towards the bottom with a hard thud. He groaned and rolled over onto his back. Fortunately, he had missed the stalagmites and landed on something soft and wet. He looked up and went to retrieve his torch. It had fallen from his hands and landed several feet away. When he picked it up again, he saw what had broken his fall and let out a startled shout and stumbled backwards. He fell to the ground again and backed up against the wall in horror. He had landed on top of Arn, or what was left of him, missing a spear by a matter of inches. A few feet away from him was the scrailing that had gone with him. Both were horribly mutilated and disfigured, but there was no mistaking the pair. Despite the bloody mess, the bodies of the two hunters weren't what had scared him. What had sent him cowering in the corner and holding out his spear defensively was the killer himself. 
It was a him, and there was no mistaking that. It stood over six feet tall, and it was coated head to toe in dark fur that was speckled with dry blood. Its arms were long and muscular, and its knuckles rested on the ground. It had hands that looked human, except for the fact that they were huge and webbed, and it had long, sharp claws that were white as snow. Its legs looked similar, except that its feet were like large bear paws. Its feet had the same white claws, but the innermost claw on either foot was longer and more curved. Its legs were also bent, and y'all could tell that if the creature stood up to its full height, that it would be well over eight feet tall. Its head looked like a moose, but there were no antlers. Instead, the monster had hands where the antlers would have been. The skin and fur stopped short of the top of the monster's head, and the creature had a cap of white bone. The creature also had sharp teeth and fangs that were at least a foot long and looked more like tusks. Worst of all was the creature's chest. There were seven holes showing through the creature's fur, at least the size of Neil's fist. Each hole showed blood and bones, and five of the seven were filled with human hearts. Each of the hearts seemed to glow with a ghostly blue aura. Top it all off was a strange amulet dangling from the monster's neck that was made from teeth and bone and glowed red in the dark. A wave of terror came over Njal as he realized the monster would take his heart and fill one of the two holes with it. He knew he needed to act quickly, and before he could think he was on his feet and threw the spear at the monster with all his might. He had aimed for one of the monster's hearts, but it had missed and buried itself in the monster's side. It howled angrily and jumped at Njal, throwing him across the cave. He landed several feet away and rolled to a stop, hitting his head in the process. He tried to draw his hand axe, but he could feel himself fading into unconsciousness. He was about to give up hope when he heard voices echoing off the cave walls. He tried to call out to them, but his voice came out raspy and weak. Finally, he couldn't hold on any longer, and he passed out. Njal woke up, lying inside a scrailing tent on top of animal furs. Berger was lying next to him and started licking his face happily when he saw that his master was awake. He sat up quickly and gasped in pain. His bones weren't broken, but he had several bruises and his whole body hurt. Four of the Skraelings heard him cry out and rushed into the tent. One of them was a young boy, somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. The second was an older woman, dressed in a strange fashion even for the Skraelings. The third was a tall man who carried himself with an air of authority. Y'all had never met him before but he immediately knew he was the chief of the Skraelings. The fourth was a man Njal recognized. He was one of the interpreters who had accompanied the Skraelings to the settlement. Njal rubbed a sore spot on his head as the old woman knelt down and started examining him. He was uncomfortable at first, but he soon realized that she was one of their healers and let her go about her work. The chief stepped in close to Njal and stood intimidatingly over him, staring at Njal with a hard look on his face. The interpreter stood respectfully behind the chief to his left. Meanwhile, the boy seemed like he was trying to blend in with the walls of the tent. The chief began speaking words that Njal didn't understand, and it gave him a headache. The interpreter translated for him, and when Njal understood, his headache became even worse. The interpreter spoke in a strong, harsh voice. I am Tulagak. I speak the words of the great chief, Atka. He says that you and the other Paleskins have brought a monster with you from across the seas. He blames the Paleskins for the death of his son, Inuksuk. And now more pale skins are preparing to attack our people. He demands to know why he shouldn't kill you now. Njal's eyes narrowed. Despite his immense pain, he brushed away the healer woman and stood up. He had to look up to stare at the chief in his eyes, and the chief looked so intimidating that he almost looked away. But Njal held his gaze. You can tell him that if he tries, then I'll send him to his gods. Tulagak didn't like that answer, but he translated it. When the chief heard the response, he leaned in close enough that Njal could feel the chief's breath on his face, and he had to fight not to take a step back. The chief spoke in a dangerously low tone, and Tulagak looked uncomfortable, but he translated the chief's words. He said that he is not in a good mood after the death of his son, and that you should measure your next words very carefully. Njal took a deep breath and turned to face the interpreter. The chief's son, Inuksuk, he's the one that went in search of the monster with Arn, right? Tulagak nodded. Yes, he went out with the pale skin to find the beast. Njal thought for a moment and then looked over at the Skraeling hiding in the corner. Can you translate for him? I can. Chief looked indignant, but Njal ignored him. Ask him what his name is. His name is Katungak. And is he the one who brought me here? With help, but yes. What did you see in that cave? The boy spoke and Tulagak translated. He says that he saw the bodies of Inuksuk and the pale skins, and a great beast with seven hearts attacking them. 
says his brother tried to slay the beast and failed. I failed too, Niall said, placing his hand on the boy's shoulder. But I am grateful for your brother's sacrifice. The boy turned away, and Niall sighed. He felt a pang of sympathy for the boy and guilt for his brother's death. But there was nothing he could do about it. He turned back to the chief. He spoke, leaving pauses every now and then for Tulagok to translate. The boy was wrong. It only had five hearts. Six now with the death of the Skraling. The monster still wants one more heart. Then who knows what it will do. It might kill us all. Now we can either waste time killing each other, or you can let me go convince my friends to help kill the beast. I leave the choice to you. The chief looked angry, but he finally relented, and Yal started preparing to leave the Skraelings. The chief left, taking the medicine woman with him, but Tulagak lagged behind. You, in a Towok, I want to have a word with you. <sighs> That's not my name. Why do you call me that? Because it is who you are. Yal rolled his eyes. And who am I? You are the one who is alone, or isolated. I have seen you around the other pale skins. You live alone, and you hunt alone. Yal shook his head. Any other nonsense you want to bring up, or can I go? He shook his head firmly. I know you plan on hunting the beast by yourself. I won't stop you. But some of our own hunters have spoken of hunting it as well. We will be meeting after dark at the old altar by the monster's lair. Yal placed his hand on the scraling shoulder. You're wrong. I plan on putting together a hunting party. We'll meet up with your men after dark. He was about to walk away, but he paused and turned back, looking at the boy. He saw the scraling meet his eyes. The night, we kill the beast. Njal walked back towards the settlement as quickly as he could manage. He hurt, but the pain had faded into a dull throb. He meant to head up to the meat hall, but when he was a quarter mile out, Bo spotted him. The older man walked up to him and clapped a hand on his shoulder, causing him to wince. Njal, thank God you're alive. The whole town thought you had gone missing like Arn. Njal grunted. Arn isn't missing. He's dead. He and the Skraling both were torn apart by the monster. He turned to Njal and gave him a very serious look. This is no time for jokes. This is no joke. Arn is dead, and the monster almost killed me too. I would have died if it weren't for the Skraelings, and now we need to go help them kill this monster. Bo's face suddenly developed a dark expression. Then you better go to the meat hall in a hurry. Half the town is ready to go on a crusade against the Skraelings. Njal started to run towards the meat hall, but he stopped and looked back at Bo. Has anyone else gone missing? Only Thyra. Njal frowned, and he felt fear rising in his stomach. He started running towards the meat hall at full speed. Then we have to move before it's too late. Bo looked confused. Nyal, wait, what do you mean? Nyal didn't stop to answer him. I'll tell you when we get there. Nyal burst into the meat hall. Most of the town was crowded around the hearth, listening to Harold, the man who owned the meat hall. He was shorter than most, but still a couple inches taller than Nyal, and he was a fat man with broad shoulders and strong limbs. Probably would have had sharp features, but his face had become pudgy and soft. He had three chins and a short, upturned nose. He had long hair that went down past his shoulders that he had neatly braided. It had been black when he was younger, but was now grey with a bald spot in the middle of his crown. He spoke with a high, shrill voice, and the crowd seemed to be hanging on his every word. Njal seemed to have come into the speech halfway. Even now Odin is with us. We are his war. These Skraelings have set themselves against our gods and the gods of our fathers. The Allfather in his wisdom has predestined us for the glory of Valhalla. But first we must drive out his enemies. Death to the Skraelings. Who is with me? The crowd started chanting and cheering. Njal shoved his way to the front. Last I checked, my father only had one god, Njal said loudly. You shame yourself, Harold. You've been drinking too much. Harold looked indignant at Njal's accusations. But the cheering faded quickly as everyone started murmuring to each other. They were all shocked to see Njal still alive. Harold looked like he was about to say something, but Njal cut him short. He told the settlers about Arn, and the monster, and the Skraelings. He relayed the whole story as quickly as he could, and when he finished, everyone was silent. This monster needs to die before it kills one more person. The Skraelings are prepared to kill it, and so am I. We need to go find it in its lair, and kill it before it's too late. Harold had been shamed into silence, but he wasn't about to let Njal have the last word and make him look like a fool. Why kill it? You said yourself this monster only wants one more heart. And besides, if it's as deadly as you say, then we might not be able to kill it at all. Njal balled his fists. The Skraelings are prepared to kill this thing, and you're just going to sit back and do nothing? 
let them kill it if they want. If they succeed, then it's one less nuisance. If they fail, then the monster will have its last heart and leave us be. Why should we risk our necks for those pagans? Y'all couldn't believe what he was hearing. It has Thyra, and besides, it will still come for you even after it has its last heart. You don't know that. Let it have Thyra. She's probably already dead, and she means nothing anyways. She means nothing? She was like a daughter to you. She was a slave. I have actual daughters and actual sons, too. I have to think of them first. What would your father say if his last son decided to go and get himself killed without leaving any descendants? Njal felt the blood rising to his face, and he punched Harold square in the nose, breaking it and sending blood everywhere. My father would be proud. What would your father say if he saw that you raised a coward who hides at the first sight of danger? He turned to face the crowd. Do what you want, but I'm going to go help the Scravens. I'm going to go save Thyra and avenge Arn, and I'm going to kill this monster. Y'all stormed out of the meat hall, leaving it in silence, save the sound of Harold cursing loudly with his broken nose. Y'all was heading to the alder, but he had one stop to make. He went to his house, the far bench where he never went. It had been his father's seat. Underneath was a large object, delicately wrapped with linen. Njal knelt down with reverence and unwrapped the package. It was his family's sword and shield. Njal remembered looking on them with awe as a child, while his father told him stories about the battles that their ancestors had fought. The shield had been passed down through five generations. It was made out of solid oak, and had a polished steel boss and solid iron rivets. Painted on the front was a dragon, woven in knots and eating its own tail. The sword was solid steel. It wasn't ornate or highly decorated, but to Njal it was almost a sacred thing. He put on his sword belt and slung his shield over his shoulder. Then he left for the alder tree. He made one small stop along the way. He knelt at the four stones where his family was buried and made a quick prayer to the Virgin Mary. Then he got up and walked away, towards the monster's lair with iron in hand. Njal and Berger arrived at the old alder that the Skraelings had mentioned. He was disappointed to only see two Skraelings. Tulagak and Katungak looked even more disappointed. Where are the others? Not coming, and they're not the only ones by the looks of it. Our chief forbid any from coming. We shouldn't be here ourselves. I won't tell if you won't. I have not seen this monster, but from what I am told, I doubt that the three of us will be able to fight it on our own. If you want to turn back, you're more than welcome. No. We intend to see this through. Y'all nodded, and the four went into the cave. Njal unslung his shield and held his torch high, and the Skraelings raised their weapons. Njal walked deeper into the cave where he had last seen the monster, but all that remained were the mangled corpses of Arn and Anuksuk, and a bloody trail leading even deeper into the cave. Njal spotted where his spear had fallen out of the creature's side and went to retrieve it. Then the four followed a trail of blood. As they walked, Njal could feel the hair rising on the back of his neck. Urger led the way with his nose, and before long the cave opened into a large antechamber. It was a large room, maybe thirty yards across, with a hole in the ceiling to let in moonlight. Njal and the Skraelings were on a ledge, about twelve feet above the monster, that ran around the outer edge of the cave. Njal saw the beast and quickly snuffed out his torch, hoping it wouldn't see them. The beast didn't seem to notice them, though, and instead it started prowling around the bottom of the cave. Tulagok spoke first, whispering into Njal's ears. It's hideous. How do you think we can kill it? We need to ambush it and destroy its hearts. Can both of you shoot at it from there? Njal asked, gesturing to two points overlooking the chamber, one on the left and the other on the right. Maybe, but only if it stays near the middle of the cave. A grim realization dawned on Njal as he realized what it meant. All right, then. I'll draw the monster out and try and keep it in the middle of the cave. The two of you shoot at it until it stops moving. If I die, which I probably will, then look for a pale-skinned woman and make sure she gets back to the settlement safely. I'll give you some time to get into position. Make sure he knows, he said, gesturing to Katungak. Tulagak nodded and explained the plan to his companion, and they both started moving to opposite ends of the cave. Njal took a deep breath and started looking for a spot to climb down to the bottom. He found a spot, and before long, he was on the floor of the cave. He looked around for the monster and spotted it, and then watched to see if the scralings were ready. Suddenly, from behind, something came up and grabbed him by the arm, yanking him backwards. He gasped suddenly in surprise. He turned to see Thyra, and she hugged him tightly and sobbed incoherently. He held her close and tried to comfort her and quieted her down. Eventually, she quieted it down, but he could still feel her trembling in his arms. He reached up and wiped a tear from her eye and hugged her again. Finally, he told her that he and the Skraelings were going to try and kill the monster, and that she needed to wait somewhere safe until it was over. 
Her eyes got big, and she started begging with him to leave the cave and run away from it. But his mind was made up, and he quietly led her to a spot where she could hide. He left her his spear and stroked her hair gently, telling her that it would be all right. Then he left her and walked towards the beast. As he walked towards the middle of the cave, he grew more nervous. The beast was gone. It had moved while he was with Thyra. He groaned softly, but he moved out into the middle of the cave. He didn't need to find it. He just needed it to come to him. Tulagak and Katunga could do the rest. He drew a sword and looked around for the creature. He was about to call out for it when he heard the sound of a pebble rolling behind him, and he turned to see the monster leaping towards him. It opened its mouth to roar, and it sounded like the roar it had made when hunting the fox. It was loud, and it shook the whole chamber, but Mial wasn't actually sure he heard it. It was as if his body could hear the monster's roar, but his ears couldn't. Mial shook, and he barely had time to raise his shield before the creature was on top of him. Mial could feel the weight of the creature bearing down on him, and he felt the force of its claws scraping against the shield. The creature grabbed onto the shield and twisted it violently, bending Njal's arm in a way it was never meant to bend, and wrenching the shield from his grip. Njal lashed out with his sword and tried to stab one of the creature's hearts. He missed, stabbing high, and when he drew back his sword, he only managed to sever the amulet. The creature howled and grabbed Njal by the leg, throwing him to the side. The landing dislocated his knee, and he screamed in pain. The creature was on him again, and it raised its arms to deliver a killing blow, but an arrow sprouted through its shoulder, and it howled in rage. More arrows followed, and the beast became frenzied. It broke off a stalagmite and threw it at Tulagak. The rock fell short, but it caused the ledge where he had been standing to collapse, and Tulagak fell tumbling to the floor. He managed to get on one knee and knock an arrow before the beast was on him. The arrow pierced its left knee, but it was the last arrow Tulagak fired. The monster knocked him to the ground, and with one deadly swipe of its claws, Tulagak breathed his last. Njal screamed out as he watched the man die. The creature used its long claws to claim its last heart. It placed it in the last hole in its chest, and it began to glow a hellish shade of red. Then the creature stood to its full height and began walking over to Njal. He tried standing, but his leg wouldn't take the weight. He raised his sword, expecting to die, but suddenly the creature howled in pain and turned away. Thyra had thrown his spear at the monster, and it buried itself in its arm. The creature removed the spear and cast it aside angrily before chasing Thyra. She had a head start, and she was already running, but Njal could tell she wouldn't make it. In desperation, he started crawling towards the amulet. Pain ran through his leg like fire, but he pushed past it until he had crawled back to where the amulet had fallen. Njal searched frantically without success while the creature chased Thyra. He tried to stay calm and keep looking, but he heard her scream. He knew the monster had caught her, and he only had a few seconds. Then, he found it, hiding behind a stalagmite. He shouted loudly and seized his blade with both hands before smashing the amulet to pieces with the pommel of his sword. The creature was poised to strike Thyra. But when the amulet shattered, it let out a terrible crock, half pain, half fury. It shrieked and howled and thrashed about madly before desperately crawling up the side of the cave and out into the night. Njal fell back against a stalagmite, wincing and gasping sharply with every slight movement of his arm or leg. He closed his eyes and tried to focus on his breathing. A few seconds later, he heard Thyra running towards him. She flung her arms around him and started sobbing. He hugged her with his good arm and started stroking her cheek softly. He lifted her chin so that he could see her face. She was covered in dirt and grime, and her face had a couple of scratches from running from the monster. She looked a little worse for wear, but in the soft glow of the moonlight, Njal thought that she looked more beautiful than any woman he had ever seen. He held her face softly in his hands and kissed her. She kissed him for a long moment before pulled him away. Njal turned over to see Katungak walking towards him. Neither one of them could understand the other, but there was no need. In the dark cave, the two men cried softly for their fallen friend. Within a week of their fight with the monster, Njal and Thyra got married. Harold made some complaints about being robbed of his daughter, but even in his battered state, one look from Njal was enough to silence the man. The settlers held a funeral for Arn, and the Skraelings held a funeral for their dead. Njal could barely move, but with Thyra's help, he managed to mount a horse and ride to the Skraelings' village to attend. After several months, Njal was finally healed and was mostly back to his normal self. Njal and Katungak learned to speak with one another and became lifelong friends. He and Thyra had nine children, and Katungak was like a second father to them. The monster was never found, and most of the settlers in the Skraelings assumed it was dead. Njal never saw the monster again either, and he retired his family sword and shield. He never used them again, except for one day each year, when he could be seen going past the four large stones out into the woods. No one ever followed him, but if they did, they would have seen him holding a silent vigil watching for a terrible monster with seven hearts.